Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Direct Snap, the top-level sports weekly NFL talk show. As always, I'm your host, Connor Grohl, here to recap everything going around in the NFL this week. It is week eight, almost at the middle of the season. We'll hit that midway point in the year next week. Uh, but for now, we got 14 matchups coming up this week. And as you can see, I've kind of redesigned um, the look of the show. Now in the left screen, instead of having all the games for the week on that left and right side, uh, we have a rundown of this week's show, frees up some more space for the rest of our show, and you'll be able to follow along where we are at any point during the show on that left side in case anyone is tuning in late. So very excited to talk about this week. We'll head straight into the headlines. And first off, I want to talk about a few headlines I am not talking about uh, because I actually have articles planned for them, hopefully to get out at some point uh, in the next few days. Uh, I'm going to write a piece about game management, and I think the tendency of a lot of NFL coaches, commentators, analysts, pretty much everybody around the game, to not really know what they're talking about as far as you know analytics and the right moves to make in certain situations. Uh, we had a few of these cases that have already taken place throughout the season. Had another pretty notable one when Pat Shermer, uh, Giants head coach, went for two down eight late in that game. And, you know, Booger McFarland on the Monday Night Football crew in particular was really ripping into that decision, which is actually backed up by math and backed up by the analytics. Uh, as far, and, and uh, so I'm going to talk about that one and a number of other um you know, kind of controversial coaching decisions. Another one from week seven was Mike Vrabel and his going for two to try to win the game being played in London, that Titans Chargers game. They end up missing the two point conversion in the last minute of the game and falling by one. You know, there's a lot of other things that have happened, you know, earlier on in the season that notorious game, the Colts lost when they should have tied, when they should have punted the ball, when they went forward on fourth down at the end of overtime on their own territory. Some more go for two decisions, clock management, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about that in an article coming up in a few days. I'm also going to write an article about my Giants because I know everyone probably tunes into this show just to hear my rants at this point. But, you know, I do have some thoughts, and we'll actually address the Giants a little bit in this first headline with the trades. Uh, but I will be... You know, addressing that in more detail in another article or maybe perhaps a YouTube video for, you know, any of the things I'm talking about right now. And finally, I do want to write an article or talk a bit about Vontaze Perfect, the dirtiest player in the league, uh, but that'll be for another time as well. So the headlines that we will discuss this week, first one will be trades. We have a lot of interesting trades have been occurring over these past few days trade deadline quickly approaching. You know, we had Patrick Peterson, actually, the Cardinals star corner, uh, request a trade. Uh, but the Cardinals, it appears, will not be looking to trade him. They're going to be denying his trade request. Uh, hello, Sumitra, and hello, everyone watching on Facebook Live. But we do have a few major trades to talk about. Uh, the biggest one happening this week, obviously, is the Raiders-Cowboys trade, if you missed this one. The Raiders are shipping Amari Cooper, Derek Carr's number one receiver, to the Cowboys for a first-round pick in a move that on the surface looks pretty good for both sides. Uh, hi, Mom, Mom. Thanks again, everyone, for watching and tuning into the show. So with this Cowboys-Raiders trade, the Cowboys, obviously, they cut Des Bryant uh, in the off season, and he is still unsigned, by the way. Uh, really would have thought someone would have picked him up by now. I think you know he rejected that offer from the Browns. He's waiting for a better offer. Uh, I, you know, it is still surprising for me. I guess he just wants too much money. Has to be the main issue. Uh, but he's still, you know, a free agent, and the Cowboys didn't really find anyone to replace him as their wide receiver one. Uh, to speak in fantasy terms, uh, for this season. 
and the Cowboys offense has not been great. You know, there's Ezekiel Elliott's still been one of the best running backs in the league, but a combination of Dak Des- Prescott not really playing too great, um, the offensive line not really being there, and not having a ton of weapons as far as receivers go. Uh, has me- meant the Cowboys have struggled uh, more so than they have in this, you know, Dak De- Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott era. So on the surface, the trade for Amari Cooper gets them their number one. For the Raiders, despite the fact that John Gruden has assured, you know, the team that they're not tanking, he's assured the media they're not tanking. I mean, this really looks like a tank move, doesn't it? Giving up one of your best offensive players. Also for the Raiders, Marshawn Lynch hits the IR this week. So their offense, you know, is in shambles at this point. But storing first-round picks. Now remember, the Raiders also picked up two first-round picks from the Bears as part of that Kolo Mack trade. So the Raiders now have five first-round picks over the next two years including three first round picks next season, which means, you know, they're going to have a lot of opportunities and we'll call it what it is. This is a tank year, but John Gruden will have opportunities to kind of build that team that he wants to have in this next season's draft, which means, you know, the potential for the Raiders to be on the come up over the next few seasons. I'm not really quite sure. Uh, how successful they'll be with that. This year's draft didn't look great for the Raiders. Obviously, this has been a less, you know, a poor start uh, to John Gruden's head coaching return uh, for the Raiders. Uh, but certainly, I think they got the better of this trade. Amari Cooper is a player that has struggled, actually, this season. On the year, uh, only 280 yards and one touchdown, only 22 catches through seven games now, or six games now, rather. But he's been a guy that struggled, hasn't really found his place in the offense, despite the fact that, you know, we know he is one of definitely the better receivers in the league. Tough to say exactly how high, but, you know, definitely top 20, I'll say. But he's a guy, he's had two games of over 100 yards receiving, the matchup against the Broncos and the matchup against the Browns. But in the other four games, he has just four catches for 36 yards on 10 targets in those other four games. So really confusing season from him. Super, super up and down. Uh, And I think the Cowboys kind of overpaid for him because he's going to be a guy that's going to command a large salary. He's a guy that has not, you know, performed up to the standard this season. And the Cowboys are in position, you know, if they end up with something like the 15th or so overall pick, they could take the top, potentially the top wide receiver, the second wide receiver off the board, and I feel like that's much better value than giving up that first round pick for a guy, again, that's going to come in a heavy salary and you're not really sure where he's at with himself as a player uh, and coming out of that really you know, tumultuous kind of Raiders system. On the other hand, when we look at the Raiders, I think it's a great trade for them, but I think it's poor handling of the trade by Coach John Gruden. And I think this has kind of been a uh, consistent uh, theme with the Raiders this season is, you know, even when they make some moves and we've criticized the Clomac trade, but really two first round picks is not, you don't want to give up one of the best players in the league, but it's not terrible compensation. But, you know, a lot of criticism around how he's handled that trade uh, as far as informing guys in the locker room, you know, apparently he did not inform guys in the locker room about the Amari Cooper trade. Um, I read something where John Gruden hadn't told the players about the trade prior to it coming out because he wasn't sure if the trade had yet been official at a time where Amari Cooper had already practiced with the Cowboys. So if that is true, that is pretty embarrassing on John Gruden's point of view. It feels like this team is making a lot of excuses. They don't really know what they're doing. You know, Derek Carr has had to put out a statement because – People, a lot of people thought Derek, or the Raiders team and Derek Carr were coming apart from each other. Uh, Derek Carr, really crazy video of him crying during the game last week, or uh, actually the week before that. They were on buying week seven, their week six game. Uh, he was just taking an absolute beating. He didn't look like he wanted to be there. Uh, you know, he Derek Carr always puts out a good message to the press. 
but everything swirling around the Raiders, you always have to wonder, you know, what's true, what's fiction, what's the real story going on beyond the, behind the scenes, because this is another one of those teams this season where there's been a lot of talk about what's really going on. As far as this team, what we do know is that they're one in five. They're probably the worst team in the league. They're incredibly dysfunctional. We didn't think they were going to be a playoff team, but we certainly didn't think they were going to be this bad. And right now they look kind of hopeless. As far as other trades go, the Giants made a couple of trades this week. First trade, they sent Eli Apple over to the Saints for either a fourth or a fifth round pick. Let me pull up. Um, a, yeah, a fourth-round pick in 2019 and a seventh in 2020. It's the official deets on that trade. And then this one coming in earlier today, actually, Damon Harrison, who's actually you know been one of the best run stoppers in the league over his career and especially over the last few years, and one of the best players on the Giants defense has been dished to the Lions for a fifth-round pick in what seems to be more of a salary dump move kind of open up more cap space for the future. Harrison is 29. You know, get a few more draft picks, nothing super high, but, you know, just give yourself the ability to make some moves with some draft picks to try out some young guys, to free up some cap space, to try to lure in some younger talent. Seems to be the move for the Giants on this tra- these, these trades. Um, a lot of talk, I think, One of the jokes that I've seen floating around a ton recently is that, you know, the Giants traded the wrong Eli uh, or maybe, you know, memes and things of that nature of Odell Beckham and his reactions to these trades every time the Giants trade somebody that's not Eli, you know, gets his hopes up and it's kind of crushed. I'm not sure I really, you know, buy into that. I think, first of all, I don't think any teams are really interested in trading for Eli. The Jaguars with that Tom Coughlin connection and with the struggling Blake Bortles, who, you know, actually will continue being the starter, but was benched uh, during part of that last game for Cody Kessler. Trust me, we'll talk about the Jaguars in the power rankings section. Uh, A lot of rumors about, you know, could Eli go there? And even rumors about this, you know, going back to last season. But the Jaguars, you know, really statement, they're not really interested. They're looking forward, or they're moving forward with Blake Bortles. So I don't think Eli is a player that you're really going to be able to get, make a trade for. And I also don't necessarily feel like the Giants need to trade for Eli. Uh, You know, the backup situation, quarterback situation is not great with Kyle Aletta and Alex Tanney. The... You know, the Giants are not in a position to really make a run at the playoffs or anything. They, I'm pretty comfortable with them drafting a quarterback in next year's draft and ending the Eli Manning era after this season. But I don't really see how making a trade for Eli is really going to help this team at this point in time. There are a lot of other problems to address. Uh, and I won't go too much into the Giants because I said I was going to write something about the Giants. But the offensive line, of course, has always been the struggle. The defense actually played pretty well in that game against the Falcons, but just a lack of ability to sustain drives. Uh, The red zone decision-making for me, for me, Manning actually lost them that game against the Falcons. But I don't really think trading him is going to solve any of the Giants' problems this season. So those are my thoughts on these trades. I think the Lions got a good trade for Damon Harrison as they try to bolster their defense on their way back to potentially a playoff appearance this season. I like that from the Lions' perspective. I don't think either of the Giants' trades were really catastrophically terrible for either side. I, out of these main trades that happened this week, I think the Cowboys kind of lost the one against the Raiders, but you will have to see. You know, if Amari Cooper ends up being one of the greatest receivers in the league for the rest of this season and beyond, then maybe we'll view that one a little differently. But I don't think any team made any horrible mistakes at the very least. Uh, this season or this week in terms of trades. Uh, The next headline, Adam Thielen, a top five wide receiver. Let's talk about Adam Thielen, you know, and a guy with an incredible story all the way from college. He was a guy no one thought anything of. Played for Minnesota State University, which I'm sure you've never heard of. Undrafted free agent, goes in the Viking system, spends a few years on the practice squad. Finally, 
you know, makes his way back onto the team and really had a breakout season in 2016. Uh, nearly a thousand yards out of absolutely nowhere. And just a guy that proves, you know, everyone loves Adam Thielen, loves to root for Adam Thielen because he's a guy that proves that, you know, hard work, work ethic pays off. Uh, he's a smart player. He's a really great player. Uh, there's been so the question really with this becomes how high do we really rank him in the league? Because I think a lot of people have still been sleeping on him. And at some point, how much more does a guy need to produce before he gets the respect he deserves? Adam Thielen in his first real full season, again, in 2016, had that 70 catches for 967 yards last season, 1,276 yards. But I want to talk about this year. In just seven games, he has gone over 100 yards receiving in all seven games, which is, you know, unbelievable. He leads the league in receptions or uh, receiving yards with 822 receiving yards. Uh, let me just do the quick check. No, he does also lead the league in receptions with 67 by 10 over Zach Ertz. What I think is really interesting, 67 receptions on 89 targets. So he's catching 75% of his targets, which is incredibly impressive. You know, the Vikings are a pretty strong offense this season with Kirk Cousins. I really love what I've seen from the Vikings. They're on a three-game win streak currently. You know, he's got the five touchdowns. He is so far, I think, probably been the best receiver in the league this year. As far as top receivers in the league are concerned, I think for me, there's always been this group, at least for the past few seasons, of Julio Jones, Odell Beckham Jr., Antonio Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, and A.J. Green. I think those five guys have been the most consistent receivers in the league for a few seasons now. Of course, there are other guys that are popping in to that group, maybe threatening that group a little bit. Tyree Kill, a lot of people have said, you know, is Tyree Kill the best receiver in the league? I don't think so. He's more of a just a speed guy. I think a lot of that comes from the offense. You see his what he does in the return game. Uh, but he's not really a consistent wide receiver one, in my opinion, a guy that you can really just try to throw to on any play. He's much different. He's more of a, I don't want to say like niche, but a certain kind of offense, certain kind of routes. He's not what you generally think of as, you know, your top receivers. Um, other guys trying to break into that, like Michael Thomas and Brandon Cooks are definitely up there. Travis Kelsey even has a tight end. But the five guys I mentioned earlier, have really been the top five for me. But I'm willing to move Adam Thielen into that top five right now. In my opinion, he's going to take the spot of A.J. Green. Uh, A.J. Green still having a really good season. Um, in my opinion, I, even though perhaps out of those top five guys, the one having the weakest start to the year is actually who I think is probably the number one receiver in the league, Antonio Brown. And even Antonio Brown, not a bad start. 40 receptions for 478 and six touchdowns, actually, in six games. But I, I still think he's the number one receiver in the league. I think DeAndre Hopkins has had a really strong start to the year, but Julio Jones, DeAndre Hopkins, Odo Beckham, Adam Thielen, I think is that next kind of group for me. Pretty hilarious. Julio Jones still doesn't have a touchdown. We all know his touchdown woes. Uh, kind of laughable at this point. Hasn't had a red zone touchdown in forever. Last season finished with 1,444 yards, and only three touchdowns on 88 receptions. This year, still no touchdowns through the Falcons' first seven games of the season. He is second in the league, just behind Adam Thielen, with 812 yards on 51 catches and no touchdowns. Now, here's an amazing stat for you, just because this is hilarious to talk about. He is second in the, in the league in receiving and has no touchdowns. If you want to go to the next highest receiver in the league as far as you know receiving yards this season that does not have a touchdown catch, you have to go all the way down to 83rd in the league. It is Pittsburgh Steelers running back James Conner, who has 257 receiving yards and no touchdowns. Julio Jones at 812, actually more than three times the receiving yards of any other player that does not have a touchdown Pretty ridiculous. 
uh, but still obviously I think one of the best receivers in the NFL, undisputedly a top five guy. As we continue on with our last few headlines, we're going to try to run through these pretty quickly. The Browns do it again. The Browns play their fourth overtime game in seven weeks. The Browns remain the most, well, I would have said the most exciting team in the league to watch, but I think that one would clearly go to the Rams or the Chiefs, you know, or at this point, the Patriots as well. But the team that plays consistently week in, week out, the closest games, four overtime games in seven weeks, uh, an additional two games decided by four points or less in regulation. And then, of course, the huge blowout lost to the Chargers, but that's just a one-time thing. But these guys, and it's not just that the Browns play close games. It's the manner in which they occur. It's the missed field goals and the fumbles and the chaos and the everything that goes on with these games. Once again, the Browns, you know, they have a 14-point fourth, fourth quarter comeback against the Bucks, And then the Bucks miss a field goal at the end of regulation, which sends it to overtime. You know, the Browns three and out, but then they pick off Jameis Winston. They get the ball like the 50-yard line or maybe even the Bucks like 40, 45-ish. But then they three and out again. They have to punt. You know, it's ridiculous. They force a punt from the Bucks. They have a great punt return, but the punt return is fumbled back to the Bucks, who then gets sacked a couple times, bringing up like a third and 30. They complete a 20-yard pass to set them up with a 59-yard field goal with for a kicker that's already missed two kicks in this game. And Chandler Catanzaro hits the miracle field goal. Like, it's such a bizarre sequence of events that took place in that game. But that's like every game the Browns play. It's absurd at this point. You know, the curse, supernatural, everything that's going on with the Browns, it makes no sense. We had a lot of high hopes for them this season. Started out strong. They're still competitive for sure. But at this point, it kind of looks like another lost season as the Browns fall to two, four, and one through seven games. Here coming up in week eight, they will have their rematch against the Steelers, a rematch that week one game that ended up in a tie. So it'll be very interesting to see how that game plays. But the Browns, I mean, you just know it's going to be close at this point. You just know a Browns game is going to be close, and some things are going to happen that are going to make you think, is this scripted? How is this possible? Etc. Talk about late-game heroics. A late game heartbreak for the best kicker in the NFL, Justin Tucker, missing the first extra point of his career at the end of the Saints Ravens game. The Saints actually come back to take a seven point lead against the Ravens. Joe Flacco and Co. drives down the field for a game tying touchdown, potentially. And then Justin Kick Tucker, the most accurate kicker in NFL history, misses the first extra point of his career he had missed, he had made. Uh, excuse me. Ooh, I forget the exact number actually, but I believe between extra points and field goals, he had made like 200 straight kicks from 33 yards and closer. He had made the first 222 extra points of his career before this miss. Or actually, that was just his career prior to this season starting. So probably closer to you know maybe. 240 or so extra points made in a row. And then he misses this one at a crucial point. Obviously, the Raven, Ravens aren't going to cut him or do anything stupid. He's still the greatest kicker in the league. It just shows you that anything can happen in these pressure situations. And it was bound to catch up with him eventually since the NFL moved the extra points back to that you know 15-yard line. The rate of conversions had gone down from 99% to about 94, 95%, and he had still been perfect. It was bound to happen eventually. It did happen to occur in just about the worst possible time. He cannot take all the blame, however, for this loss. The Ravens were in control of that game for a while uh, before Drew Brees did what Drew Brees does. Made that comeback, got the Saints another win. Saints now improving to 5-1 and one on the season. Ravens falling to 4-3, and three, but... The Ravens still look like one of the best teams in the AFC, in my opinion. 
And then lastly, the Chiefs return to form. Chiefs playing in a game against the Bengals. I thought it was going to be a very close game, a very high-scoring game. It was high-scoring for one team. You know, that's the Chiefs, 45-10. to 10, Absolutely blew the Bengals out of the water. This was a big response game for them after they dropped their first game of the season, 43-40, to the Patriots the previous Sunday night. Chiefs playing on two Sunday nights in a row. Pat Mahomes, as always, 358 yards, four touchdowns. You know, they were running all over the place. They were throwing the ball everywhere, near unstoppable. The defense, actually, though, again, like I said in their match against the Jaguars, is the main thing for me. We know their offense can throw up tons of points. They do it in bunches. They do it every week, all the time, 24-7, 365. But the defense has struggled in a lot of their games this season. They've allowed four, uh, 30 points or more uh, four times, or I'm sorry, just three times. Uh, but another, another game with 28, another game with 27. So five of their seven games allowing 27 points or more. Tough to go 6-1 and one with a defense like that, but that's what the Chiefs have been able to do. But in my opinion, this was just a huge game against a strong offense as the, as the Chiefs you know, keep on keeping on at 6-1. and one. This is actually incredibly exciting. It has just occurred to me that, what was this, week 8, 9, 10, 11, the Chiefs and the Rams will play on Monday Night Football. Two best teams in the league. What, can you even imagine if we're at a point where the Rams enter, the Rams enter this game 9-0, and the Chiefs enter this game 9-1? and They have not had their bye at this point. Can you even imagine how incredible a game that will be? I know I certainly... I'm looking forward to that one. That would be that game is going to be amazing. Uh, looking forward to that one in three weeks. But yeah, the Chiefs with a big bounce back game for them. That'll do it for our headlines. Moving on to the power rankings, one through thirty-two. Every week we take it in quarters. Let's start from the bottom. And this week. For me, some of you might think I'm getting a little lazy on these power rankings. Not a lot of change. Uh, no, I really thought these things through, but not a lot of change required. Kind of interesting. We're reaching that point of the season where I think things are starting to settle down. We're starting to get a good idea of you know how good these teams are. Enough of a sample size to make some real observations, clearly. you know, Next week will be the midway mark in the season. So not a lot of change. We saw the Raiders on by. They stay at the bottom. 49ers, Cardinals, Bills all get crushed. The Giants lose a close one. I think they should have won that game, but that's neither here nor there. They lost. The Colts actually pulled off a humongous victory over the Bills, 37-5. to uh, Yes, that's right, 5 with the safety. Of the Colts still, in my opinion, not strong enough to really move up above any other teams. And when you beat the Bills, it doesn't really prove too much because we've seen a lot of teams beat the Bills, and then the question becomes, well, that's great that you won, but can you you know, beat an beat a NFL-quality football team? So the Colts staying where they are. The Titans fall in a couple spots after that close loss in London, and then the Browns, yeah. I mean, they're the Browns. So we continue on. Bucks and the Broncos move up a couple spots, but again, not against the greatest competition in the Browns uh, and the Cardinals. Broncos, though, with a humongous victory over the Cardinals. Big blowout game. I thought it was going to be a lot closer on Thursday. I picked the Cardinals, actually, to take that one, and I got that one wrong. And then, well, we can preemptively show the next section. Just a whole bunch of teams at three and four, four and three, three and three. This is where we see you know, the pack, as we would call it, I think. All these teams in these two columns are in the playoff hunt. And the second half of their seasons, you know, we'll kind of determine where they actually end up. But a lot of similarities between a lot of these teams. I think some of those teams at the very top, like the Panthers and the Bears, are 
definitively kind of the best teams in this group. You see the Jets falling, the Dolphins falling. At this point, I think kind of pretenders. Sam Darnold still pretty turnover prone. Now he goes up against the Bears, who have struggled defensively the last few weeks, definitely looking for a big bounce-back game and a good opportunity for them to do so. Uh, moving on to some of these other teams, you know, the Falcons move up through with that win against the Giants. The Jaguars, ridiculous tumble continues as they lose their third game in a row and fourth out of five. And it's really coming down to offense. And I told you Blake Bortles was benched for Cody Kessler. Uh, and when you get benched for an ex-Brown starter, you know, that's never really a great sign. And he'll be the quarterback moving forward. But when you look at this Jaguars offense, they had a bit of an anomaly game where they scored 31 against the Jets. But outside of that, in their last four games, they have scored a total that's right, a total of 37 points, an average of just over nine points per game. They have not exceeded 14 in any of those games. And their last two games against the Texas teams, the Cowboys and the Texans, they lose a combined 60 to 14 with just a touchdown to show for themselves in each of those games. And... You know, running backs have been out. Fournette's still out. Carlos Hyde, who they traded for, missed the last game. But seven points a week is absolutely inexcusable, and it has to go on Blake Bortles at this point. And Blake Bortles has never been a great quarterback, and he's always been a guy for the past few years that people have, you know, said, are they going to replace and talk about getting another quarterback? I mean, the last two weeks, Blake Bortles has 210 passing yards over two weeks. Two weeks. Just really struggling. And, again, never been a great quarterback. A guy who looked better than he had in his first few seasons last year, for sure. But always, you know, one of those, again, another one of those turnover-prone guys. A guy that's never had a huge grasp of the offense. And, and the Jaguars have been carried by that defense. And the Jaguars' defense has not been as good as it used to be. And Jalen Rams, you look will be the first to tell you that. But you cannot... I mean, it kind of reminds me of those Tim Tebow Broncos. That, you know, Tim Tebow had a great record as a starting quarterback. He looked at every game, though, and it was like they won 13-10 every week. And it was like, congrats, Tim. Like, you have the best defense in football. And you cannot rely on a defense, especially when you're only scoring seven points a game. You can't rely on a defense to give you seven three wins. I mean, you got to put up some points. And the Jaguars have been really struggling and really unable to do much of anything offensively. Which is why a few weeks in the season, they were a top... How high did they even peak in my power rankings? Maybe number three? They might have been three. Might have even been two, actually. But now at 19. And how about the Texans at 16? Falling, you know, a week three game that I was at. Giants, Texans. Both these teams entered that game 0 and 2. And everyone was wondering, you know, and everyone was saying, obviously, you know, the loser of this game is basically toast. Teams that start 0 and 3 have a 2% chance of making the playoffs. The Giants won the game. What's happened since? The Giants have gone 0 and 4. The Texans have gone 4 and 0. And not all these games have been in spectacular fashion. You know, games against the Bills, games against the Cowboys. You know, played a couple overtime games in that stretch. But this was a big win for them to control the division at four and three. See the Jaguars at three and four. See the Titans at three and four. See the Colts at two and five. Texans sole possession of first place, got the win over the Jaguars, who are definitely the second best team in this division. And they are two and oh in the division. I frantically make sure. Oh, no, they did. They did lose to the Titans. I 
people want to check that. They do lose the Titans in week two, but I don't think the Titans are going to be challenging for this division. I think the two teams that might do it are the Colts and the Jaguars, and they have wins over both of those teams. So the Texans are actually in a really great spot at the Jaguars' expense. That was a huge game, and I think that'll you know definitely come into play later in the season. That's going to be one the Jaguars wish they won and wish they had any kind of offense to show for themselves. A few other teams in this section. Let's see, Cowboys losing a close one to the Redskins. Redskins at 4-2. and two. How about the Redskins now with a game-and-a-half lead over the NFC East and with a win over the Giants, which is becoming more and more like a sure thing these these days, the Redskins could be five and two. And this is a team I read out the stat on last week's show about them being super up and down, or I'm sorry, super. Well, yeah, super up and down as far as being super consistent. They can't win two games in a row. You know what was it? They were six and six over the last twelve, and seven and seven over fourteen, and ten and ten over twenty, and you know seventeen and seventeen over the last thirty-four. And but now the Redskins are stringing some wins together, and they could be five and two. And they could really be in this upper echelon of teams if they continue what they've got going. And Adrian Peterson, how about that guy? He's never done, is he? He's never done. Just when you think he's going to retire, just when you think he can't possibly keep doing it, he keeps doing it. Last two weeks, 97 yards against Carolina, 99 yards against Dallas. The Redskins keep on rolling. Good for him for Washington. Bengals, I'm not super worried about them, even though they took the big loss to Kansas City. I think they can still compete for that division. I like what I saw against the Bears, even though they lost that one. Almost pulled off one of the incredible plays that you're ever going to see with that Hail Mary at the end of the game. They completed the Hail Mary, but just a yard short. Reminiscent of that Titan Super Bowl. I mean, not really. It was a much different kind of play. Uh, but, you know, still coming up a yard short, and that could have forced overtime for them. And then out the Panthers. Down 17 nothing against the Eagles. Scored three touchdowns in the fourth quarter. Steal that one away. Good stuff. Moving to top eight. And again, not much change at the top, not much change at the bottom. A little bit in the middle. But overall, not a lot of change. Our top four stays the same. Rams, huge win, like we would have expected, of course. Chiefs with the big win. Patriots win at Chicago, give them props. Saints with the big comeback win against the Ravens. Vikings, for me, to move up against the Chargers because they looked much better, uh, I think, in their matchup, beating up the Jets compared to the Chargers nearly dropping that one to the Titans at the end of the game. And Ravens, Steelers, Steelers on that bye, and Ravens losing a close one to the Saints, but you see where the Saints are in the power rankings. There are worse teams you can lose to. In fact, there are, for the Ravens, 27 of them. That's the power rankings. Games of the week, let's do it. Top three games for you NFL Sunday ticketers or just people looking for the best games to stream or you know, watch if they're nationally televised for you. My number three is going to be the Ravens and the Panthers. This one really excites me. Four and three, four and two. You see the records. These are you know two pretty good teams. Seven for the Ravens in my power rankings, nine for the Panthers. Both coming off dramatic finishes their games in week seven, the Panthers, their comeback, the Ravens, their near comeback. Similar kinds of teams for me. Strong defensively. Quarterbacks with Super Bowl experience. I think it's going to be a close one. I think it's going to be a good one. You'll have to wait just a bit to see my prediction. This one is... The early Sunday slate. Catch that one at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, noon Central. My number two game of the week. I think the Rams will win this game, but I think it'll be super fun to watch the best team in football go up against Aaron Rodgers and see Aaron Rodgers try to single-handedly keep the Packers in this game, throwing for 
I'll probably need about 600 yards in this one. <laughs> Should be a lot of fun. Again, just expecting this one to be the highest scoring game of the week. And the Rams to prevail with that one in the afternoon session. And then the number one game of the week, Sunday night. How about it? You know, a lot of these best, a lot of my um, number one games of the week have been these Sunday nighters. And that just means whoever makes the schedules needs a bit of a raise. Got to get these best games on when everyone will be watching. And I'll be watching this one for sure. Saints 5-1. and one. I get these two of the best teams in the NFC. If the Rams weren't in the NFC, I would entertain this as a NFC championship preview, potentially. But these are two division leaders. And these are two teams super hot. The Vikings have won three in a row. The Saints have won at least that many. Let's see, four in a row? Five in a row? Five in a row. Of course, of course. How could I forget? They lost the first week of that season, that Fitz Magic game, 48-40 to the Bucks. So a couple teams super hot, two of the hottest teams in the league. Vikings especially looking great in that game against the Jets. And Saints with their comeback, it's a bit of an offense-defense. It's a very similar type of game to the game the Saints played last week against the Ravens. I would expect a very similar kind of pace and kind of flow to that one. And I think this one, out of all the games, is going to be the best one this week. So catch it on Sunday night. Ooh. I don't know why that slide was still in there from last week, but heading into the predictions, finally got some momentum last week. Nine and five straight up, and f against the spread, seven and six. Trust me, I'll take seven and six after the horrific stretch we had been on. That Browns game, I took uh, the Browns plus three, and that was the push. That's why we don't add up to 14, only up to 13. I'd like to christen this week, you know, the kind of put up or shut up week. Because as you'll see as we go through these 14 matchups, we have a lot of games between these, again, like I said, that middle half of the power rankings, all those three and three, three and four, four and three teams in that playoff hunt as the games start to become just a bit more meaningful. A lot of matchups between these teams. A lot of matchups between teams in the same division and conference and games that could be meaningful down the road to kind of set the tone for these teams as they either head into their bye or start the second half of their seasons following the bye. So let's get straight into it. Dolphins, Texans, a couple four and three teams on completely different trajectories. The Dolphins starting out 3-0 and and the Texans starting out 0-3. But here they both are with the same record through seven. Osweiler will start again on the short week. Three straight weeks of Osweiler. This is this Brocktoberfest? Um, I like the Texans to take this game for their fifth in a row. I do think the Dolphins will keep it somewhat close. So I will take the points and go Miami that way. Uh, but Texans definitely for the win, in my opinion. But Brock Osweiler still has been better than expected. Eagles taking on the Jaguars. Now this is a matchup. I don't think these teams lost a combined eight games in last year's entire regular season. I mean, what a drop-off this year has been for the Eagles. Your Super Bowl champions and the Chiefs, we see the Jaguars. I'm sorry, the Jaguars. Jaguars did go 10-6 and six last season, and the Eagles 13-3. and three. So they lost a combined nine games last season and already eight so far. And by the end of Week 8, it will be nine because one of these teams has to lose. I think the team losing will be the Jaguars. Maybe even 20 points is a bit generous considering the numbers I've showed you today. 
talking about the Jaguars' offensive output as of late. I do think the Eagles, well, I would say need to get, that they'll find a way to get it together eventually. You know, I thought the Eagles had got it together after that big win against the Giants, and then the 17-0 start against the Panthers kind of blew that one. But still, I think showing some positive signs, they almost, almost nearly were able to come back at the end of that one and steal it back from the Panthers, unable to do so. But I do like them to win 27-20. Move things to 4-4. Four and four. And stay chasing the Redskins. Because if the Eagles lose this one, the Redskins, man, they could just be running away with the division. And who would have thought that entering this season? Ravens-Panthers, like I said, one of my top games of the week. I'm going to take the Ravens 24-20. Panthers are at home. Ravens, though, the two-point favorites, a lot more confidence in them. The Panthers are an interesting team. We've seen a lot of good and a lot of bad from them so far. Obviously more good than bad with that 4-2 and two record. But I do like Baltimore to take this one in Week 8. Jets-Bears. The Bears, can they use this matchup against Sam Darnold to jumpstart their defense? The offense needs no jump starting, as we saw last week. So I think this will be a nice one for the Bears. Get themselves back over 500 in what is now. It feels like the best defense in, or the best uh, division in football keeps changing. Early At the very beginning of this season, I would have told you it was the NFC South. A couple weeks ago, I would have said the AFC North. Now it looks like the NFC North. No team under 500 in this division. Vikings at four, two, and one. Packers at three, two, and one. Bears and Lions at three and three. Jets fall into three and five after this week. Bucks and Bengals. Jameis Winston picks up his first win of the season in that chaotic overtime period against the Browns. Again, another one of these matchups a three and three plays a four and three. I think that when you think about it. These teams may be three and three and four and three, but they're in they're in different worlds, aren't they? The Browns to me feel or the Bengals to me rather, a lot of B teams in the NFL. The Bengals to me feel like a team with division championship hopes, playoff hopes, and could really do it after their strong performances this season, whereas the Bucks to me look like a team that's just trying to hold on for dear life. Try to pick up a few wins here and there to keep themselves in some kind of conversation. But book 6-10 and 10 for the end of the season for the Buccaneers, in my opinion. On the other side, book 10-6 and six for the Bengals. I like the Bengals to take this one. Give them 30-24. to 24. Seahawks-Lions, another good one. This one was nearly one of my best games to watch this week. Really interesting to see the Seahawks come back from there by traveling co- cross country, not full, not all the way to that East Coast, but a long ways to Detroit. Lions beat the Dolphins last week, beat the Packers the week before. That's two in a row, and I've liked what I've seen from this offense. Dolphins, well, the Dolphins are four and three, so I can't completely discount that one, but on a good bit of momentum and I like them to keep it going with a 27, 23 victory over Seattle Broncos chiefs chiefs favored by 10 The Broncos actually gave the chiefs their closest game of the season prior to that game against the Patriots that they lost already in week eight, getting the rematch, the reverse fixture First time around, Broncos were at home. It was a 27-23 win for the Chiefs. I like a similar kind of game. 31-24, I like the Chiefs to win, but you know, not by double digits. I think the Broncos will keep this one close, and those defensive or those divisional games are always some of the closer ones because they just know each other so well. And I think the Broncos will put up a better, much better performance here than they would against 
maybe a Rams or a Saints against the Chiefs. Redskins, Giants, somehow the Redskins are only favored by a single point in this one. Use flash. I think it'll be close too. Giants have played a lot of close games this season. You know, uh, nearly took that one against the Falcons, nearly took one against the Panthers. The record is awful, and I don't think they're going to win the game. But I do like them to put up a decent showing in another one of these divisional matchups, try to play some kind of spoiler to what the Redskins have going right now. I don't think it'll fully work. And the defense certainly won't be as strong now. Down two more starters. But I do like what I saw from the offense last week in terms of everything that came outside of the red zone. I mean, what's the uh for? Dad, I mean, come on. I know, I'm, I'm supposed to give the Giants a win here. Am I really? One and six? Am I supposed to give them a win here? Come on. I want to pick the Giants as much as you do. <sighs> Look, I'm trying to get a few games right here. And I've picked the Giants to lose, and I've been right about it for about the last three weeks. You know, it's tough. It's tough rooting against the Giants every... I'm not rooting against the Giants, first of all. Dispel that notion. Rooting for them to win every Sunday. But do I think they'll do it? Not really. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Brown Steelers, the rematch. I thought about joking around and throwing up a 24-24 tie prediction. That'll be my secondary prediction if that's allowed, which I know it's not. Realistically, Steelers by eight? That feels a little big, don't you think? 28-24, I think it'll be a close one. I don't know. Let's make up a scenario. Steelers are up 21-7. to Browns score two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. With two minutes left, it's 21-21. Ben Roethlisberger throws a pick. On the first play, the next drive, Browns kick a long field goal. Steelers get the ball with 45 seconds. They somehow score a touchdown. Antonio Brown. Sure. And I think if that were to actually happen, that would be a bit underwhelming by Brown's standards this season. Maybe I should have made it a little more, more crazy. Or maybe that would have just made me crazy. I don't know. But I'll take the Steelers by four. Raiders and Colts. Who will be the worst team in the AFC? Newsflash. Still the Raiders. Like the Colts in this one, 31-27. Who will be the worst team in the NFC? I'll say the 49ers. I like the Cardinals to take this one at home. And no, I don't think either one of these teams are really going to find too many more wins outside of when they play each other. But hey, fighting for third in the division. I'll take the Cardinals. And can we also just say how easy of a division this is for the Rams? I know they're the best team in football, 7-0. and But the Seahawks are 3-3, three and three, and in my opinion, probably one of the weaker 3-3s. Three and threes. And then you got these two teams. I mean, they're really being gift-wrapped this division, aren't they? Speaking of the Rams, yeah, I think this one will be a little closer than maybe some people will be expecting just because Aaron Rodgers seems to never get blown out. 34-27 is going to be my call on this one. Uh, of course, like another strong performance from the Rams offense. Sunday night or game of the week. Saints and Vikings. Man, this is just a really great matchup, isn't it? And I did go back and forth on this prediction a little bit. I'll admit it. What decision did I come to? I decided to take the Saints. 27-21. I saw them win a big game on the road last week, and we'll bet on them to do it again. And then that Monday night are the Bills. The Bills are heavy underdogs, part eight. 
14 points in this one, but for a good reason. And yeah, yeah, 35 17. I'll take the Patriots to beat the Bills. My phone is notifying me that Odell Beckham just went live on Facebook. As I listen to a little bit of Odell Beckham. Looks like he's about to do something of a Q&A, not in the greatest spirits, and who could blame him after this 1-6 start? So I'll head into this questions period. I'll jokingly say, let's make this a little quick so I can listen to my boy Odell. Uh, but anything you guys want to talk about, whether that's NFL, whether that's college football, whether that's basketball, you see the teams on by this week, Titans and Chargers, Cowboys and Falcons. Give me what you got, and we'll answer a few before we tune off for this week. Lewis, this still says week seven. Nope, we're still week eight. Still week eight. Always make a mistake or two on these final slides. But, you know, let me know what you think about you know, my picks this week. You know, what you think about the new kind of outline of this show, keeping it single tone with this top level sports blue. And you're, you know, where we are in the show on that left hand side. As far as other things are going, I mentioned a few of those articles I'm going to try to write out. I don't really know if they're going to, going to end up being articles or videos. I uh, got a few more videos planned, a few other things planned, non-NFL related. I guess just stay tuned for that. I hate making promises because <laughs> feels like I'm always a little late to uh, deliver sometimes. But uh, we do our best. We do our best. Chances the Browns see more OT? Oh, I don't know. Like, judging by the first four, seven weeks of the season, about 57%. The Browns play in overtime every week. Or if you want to use the old joke, a 50% chance the Browns play an overtime game this week because either they do or they don't. Realistically, what are the overtime odds? Usually about 5% a game goes to overtime, give or take. It's just ridiculous that they've played so many. Yeah, thanks uh, for the comments on the graphics. You know, I think... Something with me as I like to go a little ham. <laughs> I like to throw all kinds of different colors at you in all kinds of different segments and have things popping everywhere. Um, but I think I'll probably keep this moving forward. I think it's just pretty simple, pretty straight to the point, and it looks pretty pretty nice in my opinion. Brown Steelers, I think. Want to see my picks against some pros. Well, no, you don't. Not this year because it's been a rough go about for me. Uh, usually doing a little better. Uh, realistically, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to pull up where I stand among the NFL Pick Watch. If you're not familiar, NFLPickWatch.com is the place to go for every pick from every NFL expert. All the big names. So what am I this season? As I scroll back 30 slides or so to find uh, my record, 61 and 44. All right, let's humiliate myself. Where we stand right now? Where will 61 and 44 get me? It'll get me in a tie for 79th out of... 113. So we're beating about a third of the experts right now. It's uh, not the best, and we're usually better, but I mean, realistically, it's not awful. I don't do this for a job or anything. And I do expect to move forward. We had a couple of brutal weeks. When will management turn on John Gruden? I don't know. They might, maybe they already have. I think they're going to give him the benefit of the doubt, give him this next draft, give him this season and next, and reevaluate afterwards. Look, it's been bad. You don't need me to tell you that, do you? 
Raiders have not had a great start to the season and they've made the trades and they've had all kinds of criticism with their play and the locker room and Derek Carr and John Gruden and this and that and everything in between. I don't know. Maybe they need to move to LA or uh, Las Vegas. Maybe that's what I'll take. Take some of that Vegas money and get them a good team. I don't know. I really don't know, but I don't foresee them doing anything this season. And that's not going to surprise or shock anybody. Uh, you know, I think probably if I had to guess, I'd say they win three to four games. Definitely in contention for that number one pick. We'll be interesting to see what they do with that number one overall pick because I don't think they need a quarterback. I mean, it's funny how Derek Carr has gone from so high to so low so quickly. A guy, I mean, he was a guy that was in the MVP talks pretty recently. He's a three-time Pro Bowler. You know, their car was almost the MVP of the league in 2016. He went 12-3 and three as a starter. And things are kind of falling off. And, oh, no, John Gruden says, oh, boy, certainly I don't see us trading car. Well, 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 well. If that's anything to go by, expect Derek Carr to be traded to the Jaguars by Sunday. <laughs> but if that's all we've got as far as questions go, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into the show on Facebook Live. And if you're here live or if you're tuning into the show after the fact, maybe even on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. Love to have you guys as always. And we'll be doing this again as we do every week, 8 p.m. Central, next Wednesday, for a spooky Halloween episode of Direct Snap. I don't know. Let me know if you want that show to be oh, maybe Tuesday or maybe earlier. Or can we just do it on Halloween night? I don't know. I think a lot of you guys will be trick-or-treating. Yeah. Probably more so with the kids than with yourselves, but I don't know. Let me know. We'll, I I am definitely open to doing that show at a bit of a different time, but you know, just let me know what we think on that front. And until next week, I've been Connor Grohl for Top Level Sports and Direct Snap. Signing off. See you next week. <laughs>